Thank you for watching video from One Church of High Point. We hope that today's message encourages you to connect to God, to others, and to your purpose. If you're looking for more information about One Church or for more resources, visit onechurchnc.net. All right. The Gravitron. Dumbest ride at the fair ever that has ever existed. For those of you who don't like rides that go around and around. Um, it's the ride, you know, where you got in there and you stood on the wall and it started to spin. And it stuck you to the wall and the floor dropped out. And, and people were trying to, like, get their arm to the middle or their leg. And then everybody threw up when they got off the ride. The Gravitron. The cool thing about it was that centrifugal force is spinning, and the force drawing you away from the center is sticking you to the wall. It makes it very hard to get back to the center. You know the spin cycle, whoever invented the washing machine, genius thing. You look inside your washing machine, whether it's a front loader or a top loader or whatever kind of loader it is, but if you look inside your washing machine, it's got a million little holes. And so your clothes are in there, fills with water, washes them, and then it goes to the spin cycle. And it spins your clothes to the outside of the drum. And the water, it's going so fast that the water inside the clothes is going out through the little holes, not your clothes going out through the little, little water is going out through the little holes. That's a spin cycle. It's because centrifugal force is working. Don't know if you realized it when you got up this morning. We are spinning on the earth at 1,000 miles an hour right now, this very second. I, I was talking to, to Saint, my grandson, out by the fire the other night, and I was telling the earth's spinning, and it's going around the sun. We had this whole big talk, and, uh, and I said, we're spinning. At, you know why we're not flying off the earth? He said, yeah, poppy, gravity. You know, like I was like, oh, I'm sorry that you already knew that. Um, they're a lot smarter than, than I think they are sometimes at a young age. But that's the centripetal force is what's keeping us in. So let's talk about that one. Not only did I come to understand a little bit more about centrifugal force, but then I discovered the new word, centripetal force. Pull that one up on the screen. Let me define that for you. A force that acts on the body moving in a circular path, and it's directed towards the center around which the body is moving. Centripetal force. Pulled in two different directions. One pulling you out. One pulling you in. Centripetal force. Ever been pulled in two directions? Oh, man. I think probably all of us can relate to a time when I feel like I'm pulled this way and I'm pulled this way. Some, some of us would say, yeah, I've been pulled in six directions at the same time. But you know what it means sometimes. You feel like you're, getting, you're, you're being pulled to this, but you're also being pulled to that, and you really don't know what to do. Well, that happens sometimes with our lives when we're dealing with with sin, and we're dealing with God at the same time. We're, we, we know what we shouldn't do. Uh, we know what we should do, and we feel like we're being pulled. Nobody understands this better than the Apostle Paul. He wrote about it to the Church of Romans in a letter. If you would, take a look with me this morning. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 this morning, about halfway through. Uh, I'm going to start at verse 14. The whole chapter, basically, he's talking about a struggle that he has with sin. Now, when I read this, I thought, wait a minute, this is Paul. This is the Paul, the Apostle Paul, the, the, the Big Daddy Paul, you know, the guy that, that is the greatest missionary that ever lived, Paul. And he's very transparent about his struggle and his battle in dealing with sin. I'm going to start at verse 14 this morning. We know that the law is spiritual, Romans 7, 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. Go down to 14, uh, 19. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin that's living in me that does it. So I find this law at work with me. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. 
he gets down, done with this, this passage, he gets done with chapter 7, and he kind of concludes in verse 24 by saying, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? And again, we're talking about the Apostle Paul, the guy that was Saul turned into Paul. He's making this huge difference around the world and all these cities and all these travels. And he's confessing through his testimony, I have a battle and I have a struggle because the things that I really know I should be doing, I don't do. And the things that I really don't want to do, I am doing those things. That's quite a testimony from a guy at the level that Paul is. I think we all understand this battle to some degree, this struggle with sin, uh, the power that it sometimes happens, uh, happens to ha be over us. And then an interesting thing takes place. I want you to see this uh, as, as you're turning to the last couple verses there. I, I understand that this is a daily battle that Paul's having. I think we all understand this. It's, it's, if there's a sin that has taken place in our life at one point in time, I tell people this all the time. The sin isn't completely gone from you. You'll never deal with it again. The sin's at your feet every single day of your life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. I wasn't born a pastor. I wasn't born a Christian. I was a late in lifer uh, to that. Saved at 28 years old. Called at 31 years old. Came into ministry with a lot of baggage and a lot of strongholds. God helped me by sending the Spirit and cleaning me, cleaning me up from those strongholds. Praise the Lord. That's good stuff. That's what happens when you accept Jesus. I'm so glad it wasn't the church that cleaned me up, by the way. Because the first person who would come to me and said, hey, I know what you're doing on the road in all those travels you do, I would have never gone back to church again. I would have never set foot in that church again. But instead, while I was on the road, the Spirit of God was meeting with me. Right, and he was nudging me. So it was the Spirit of God that was cleaning me up. But here's the thing. Just because I've been free from uh, alcohol, porn, tobacco, all these different things, all these sins from my past life, it doesn't mean that they're removed from my life. In fact, they're at my feet every single day of my life. Every single day of my life, they're right there. Here's the deal, people. I control them. They don't control me. Right? Greater is he that is in me that is in the world. I control them. They don't control me. So here's the good news. Here's where we start with this thing. How many times have you had to apologize for some of the same goofy mistakes that you've made a million times? <laughs> mm. Don't raise your hand. It's okay. How many times have you allowed the enemy to drag you off to the dark place? And you don't want to be in the dark place. You hate the dark place. Anybody understand what I'm talking about with the dark place? A kid that was prone to depression in middle school? I know the dark place, and I hate the dark place. I used to camp in the dark place for a week at a time, two weeks at a time. And I hate it, but yet I found myself there all the time. How many times have you allowed the enemy to drag you off to the dark place? How many times have you retreated when you should have advanced? You know you should have advanced. You, should, you know you should have followed the nudge of God, but instead you didn't. You retreated from that. How many times have you, uh, did pride take over? How many times did you say the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time? <laughs> I know none of you have ever done that. And you wish you had never said a word. How many times have you asked for forgiveness for the same thing that you said you would never do again? This is what Paul's talking about. Aren't you glad you don't wear a sin meter? <laughs> would, that be, would that be a terrible thing? That if, if you had to wear the little meter like, you know, on your, on your head or on your, on your chest or whatever, you know, like, like uh, you, you know, some kind of thing that basically it's on a scale of 1 to 10. It's in the green if it's good. If it's in the yellow, it's not. And then it's in the red. It's like dangerously close, like a tachometer. I'm so glad that none of us have to wear the sin meter, um, you know, because nobody would want to serve me. Nobody would want to. Everybody would be unclean, unclean, you know, stay away, stay away. I'm so glad we don't have to wear something like that. But check this out in Romans 7. 25. You ready for the turn? Here we go. Paul gets done with all that stuff he said in chapter 7, and he concludes it with these two verses. But verse 25, he says, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, Yeah, I deal with it every day. It is an ongoing battle. The things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things I wish I was doing, I wasn't doing. But I love the word yet in the Bible because it's a game changer. Yet. 
thanks be to Jesus Christ, our Lord, because with him, I've got centripetal force. <laughs> the world's pulling me away, but guess what? There's a force greater than centrifugal force. There's a force called centripetal force, and it's greater than centrifugal force, and it's pulling me out of the miry clay. Let's take a look at a couple of these verses in chapter 8, because chapter 7 is kind of a bad news chapter. It's talking about sin, the battle of sin, and all those things. But chapter 8 is a really cool chapter, because he said, this is your way out, people. He said, therefore, in verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There we go. Somebody, somebody fully under because of because of all that I just said, and because of Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. There, I don't stand before God early in the morning, and He says, "Oh, you filthy sinner! I know what you thought last night. I know what you did yesterday." There's no now no condemnation because of the Spirit that lives within me. I have a counselor, and I have somebody who's going before me. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to go down to verse 5. Stay with me. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit, capital S, desires. The mind of the sinful man's death is the sinful man's death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit, capital S, is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God and does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. But here we are in verse 9. You, however, anybody in Christ Jesus in this room? Okay, then I'm talking to you right now. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, capital S, and if the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to Christ. But, verse 10, if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet, there's that word I love so much, yet. Our spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit, the Spirit of God of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who lives in you. He will save you. He will rescue you. He will pull you out of the miry clay. Goes on to say, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For you have not, for you, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit, it just keeps coming back to the spirit. I think the point of this whole thing is you got to have the spirit, right? The spirit you'll put to death, the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of a wuss. No, it doesn't, doesn't say that. I'm sorry. It says you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies <laughs> with the Spirit that we are God's children. Now, we have, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And if we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Can I just ask you guys a question? Do you really understand when it says that you are heirs? For those of you who have received Christ... Not believe in Christ. I'm talking about open up your heart at some point in time. You have a story that you receive Christ into your life. You receive the Spirit, okay? You're born again. You are saved. You understand that? Are you with me? And you receive the Spirit, and because of that, you are heirs. Your stepbrothers, Jesus Christ. Some of you are going, huh? It's true. Is he the Son of God? Are you a son or daughter of God? Then, you're, then he's your stepbrother. Why aren't we living like that? I mean, that, that should be a wake-up call sometimes. When you're feeling a little down, you had kind of a cruddy day, and you're having some difficulties and troubles, can you ever just stop long enough and just smile at the problem and say, you don't know who you're messing with, dude. I'm God's son. I'm an heir to the kingdom of heaven. 
You have no idea who you're messing with. Sometimes we just got to get a little bolder in who we are, identity. Yes. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. I love this. This gives us this gives us this centripetal force, this Holy Spirit. This is a powerful thing. God gives us this beautiful hope that we can control sin. It doesn't have to control us. It's a powerful thing. So the very first part of this, there's only two things you need to understand about this passage. And number one is what I said earlier about the re- relationship with Jesus. Okay? you got to be in a relationship. Um, all the religion of Christianity is going to do is throw you a box of Kleenexes. If you're proud because you're a Christian and you wear the name Christian, I'm a Christianity, but if you believe that you've received Jesus and you are a Christian and he is actually in you, now that's a different thing. You won't get a box of Kleenexes, you'll get a rope, all right? You'll get a rope to help pull you out when you need pulling out. It says in Scripture, as we were reading it there a minute, it says, therefore, that very verse 1, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Further down in the Scripture, it was talking about when Christ Jesus is in you. This is a relationship. He talks about a, a lot about it in John 15. If you remain in him and he remains in you, this is a relationship, not a religion. How do you form a relationship with somebody? You got to spend time with a person. I have acquaintances in my life. I know about people in my life, but that doesn't mean I'm in a relationship with these people. I'm in a relationship if it's a brother or sister. We spend time at the table. They know me. I know them. We hang out. We eat together. We talk together. We do fun things together. I'm in a relationship. That's what Jesus Christ wants from us. He doesn't want your religious stuff. He wants you to do life on a daily basis. If you want the spirit of God to be activated in you, then you have to have him. And listen, that means you got to spend some time with him. Okay? I was sharing just recently with somebody, there's 169 hours a week. And, And we have this thing called the hour of power on Sunday morning for an hour. And a lot of people feel like that's good. If I do the hour of power out of my 169 hours, I'm good to go. But that's not Christ in you, in you in Christ, right? That's just you coming and paying honor and respect to Jesus because you feel like that's a good thing to do. I'm not doubting it. That's a good start. But he wants so much more from you than just doing the hour of power. He'd like to do each day with you, okay? So we make this mistake sometimes is that we go into our day, and there's a lot of things that rob us of the, of the joy uh, in the thing. So here, let me ask this question. The second point of this I want you to understand. And it talks a little bit about, I think it was in verse 5. It says, therefore, those living according to the Spirit, they have their minds set on what? They have their minds set on the nature. I'm talking about the next, next line down. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires see the second part of this you got to ju- is fine you got to be in a relationship i think we're at that point we clearly understand that but there's something else you can be in a relationship but the question should be but what is it you want from me what is it that's on your mind god whatever's on your mind i'd like to have that on my mind because my mind's just a mess my mind's always thinking about stupid stuff and self oriented stuff but what's on your mind how can I be part of that if you want to live a life being pulled by centripetal force to the center if you want to get off that wall stuck to that wall and you want to get back to the center where Christ is you got to understand you got to get your mind with his mind you got to get that in sync so let's let's just hang right there for a minute okay where's your mind on the on, on average on any given day What do you spend the most time thinking about? If you had a pie chart, okay, not on your head, but I'm just saying if you had a pie chart, which kind of split up every hour of every day on average, and you could look at that pie chart where it said this much time you're thinking about gaming or this much time you're thinking about your job, this much time you're thinking about your health and your body, and this much time you're thinking about this thing, this much time you're thinking about your to-do list. 
This much time you're thinking about your worries. This much time you're thinking about what you don't have instead of what you do have. We spend a lot of time on this thing thinking about things outside of, but what about you, God? What about you, God? What is it that's on your mind? How can I get my mind on the things with the Spirit of Christ? If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong. And it got to that verse where it said, yet you, you, Lord, uh, our spirit, our spirit, capital S, you can direct my thoughts. How do you direct? How can you have your thoughts directed is a big question. I want you guys to really embrace that. So many times we, we look at things and we go, um, like I was just sharing a minute ago, maybe you're thinking more about the things you don't have in life than the things you do. It wasn't really that long ago I was sitting at church a couple years ago, and things have changed a lot at Christ Wesleyan Church. Over the last few years, after we, after we lost 40 people to one church, I used to say that a lot, and then God corrected me. He said, you didn't lose anybody. You know exactly where they are. You sent, so stop using the word lost. <laughs> you sent 40 people to C4, which became one church. That's a big difference. But along with that came, it was right during the pandemic, right at the start of the pandemic. You all went through it too, a lot of you, and you remember. But during the pandemic, we had the mask wars, and we had other wars going on, and some things happened. Uh, over those first few years, I did 18 funerals for seniors at my church. They were the big givers, by the way. They were the ones that were showing up in the full. I started losing, losing, losing. I didn't have a live worship team. I didn't have, I still don't. Uh, no live music, uh, no youth group, no children's ministry. Lead a church without any of that, right? The building's getting old. Uh, the neighborhood's getting kind of rough. And I was sitting in my office one day looking at all the things I didn't have and wondering what happened. It was going so good until Ryan abandoned me. <laughs> it was going so good. But I was kind of sitting over there, and the Lord started talking to me about those things. He started redirecting my thoughts. He started saying, but what do you have? And I started saying, well, I got this building, <laughs> this, this big old early American with four big white columns, you know, churchy looking thing, looks like a church, smells like a church. He said, well, you need to use it. You need to use it for the kingdom. He said, what about that building out back? That little trailer building we got out there. I said, yeah, we haven't used that in four years. That's just been shut down, sitting empty. He said, what about all those homeless people, street people you got around your church? So oh, yeah, all those moochers, you know, that hold the signs up and beg for money and stuff like that. He said, yeah, what about them? And God opened up my heart, and he gave me a heart for the homeless and the street people. I have 60 congregants that come to my church every single week that live on the streets. But they've never been there on a Sunday. But I see them, and they see me. Some of them call me... A preacher man, some of them call me Stone Cold. Some of them, they have street names for everybody. And I know Joker and Rambo and Cat Girl and all the other people. And I go into those homes, I go into the woods, into those camps, and we have meals. We go sit down, we eat meals. We have scripture. We have a devotional for the day. Go to six different camps. Um, and we have about 15 or 16 that come to the Hope Center at the church to do their laundry and get a meal and get some clothes and get toiletries and things like that. So I got the Hope Center, but you can't see them. When you're preaching on Sunday, they're not there in front of you. And one day I was, I was still kind of contemplating, man, it just seems like everything. And uh, I was going home, and I was, I was whining to death. Man, it was like 70 people there today. It was just kind of a downer kind of thing. And, and again, we got to that place, but you can't see what's really going on. Because you didn't get to see one church today. You didn't get to see all those people. And if you did bring them all over to Christ Wesleyan, they wouldn't fit in the sanctuary anyway. And you didn't get to see Spencer Lohman and, and his hundred people at Emmaus Church that you planted. You don't get to see them either, Pastor Ken. And you don't get to see the Haitian church that meets upstairs in the, in the youth room with 70 people that don't speak. They speak French Creole. That's why they meet separately up there. And I'm not there at 2.30 when La Roca comes in with about 80 people and worships downstairs in the Latino church. And I'm not there at 4 o'clock. 
when the Japanese Fellowship Church comes in for Bible study in my neighborhood. I couldn't fit those 500, 600 people in my church even if I had them. But see, I lost sight of them. God sometimes has to shake you up and get your mind back on the things. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to testify to you today about this. Greater is he that is in me than in the world. And that's 1 John 4.4. 4. You can bank everything you own on that verse. Greater is this intrepidal force that's in you through the Holy Spirit of God than any other force that's in the world. Any other demon that comes against you, any other evil that comes against you. So many times, you, you know the Lord's Prayer, because uh, you've said it like 300,000 times in your life. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be come. I, I, I got so sick of hearing my wrestling team at East Davidson uh, back in the day. When they took the mat, you remember, Josh, they would slide to the middle, and it all circle up. And, and I was proud of them because I said, you guys should pray before we wrestle the other team. You know, show them who you are. And so they would all warm up, slide to the middle. And then it sounded like some kind of tribal chant. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. I can your home. I will be. I couldn't even understand any of it. Had to teach him what it actually meant to say the Lord's Prayer. But there's a part of that says, deliver me, deliver me from evil, for thine is a kingdom. My prayer in that version is, Lord, save me from myself. <laughs> deliver me from the evil one, because he's always out there wanting to tear me up and consume me. But deliver me from myself, too, because I get so stupid and misguided at times. Help me, God. Deliver me from And the Spirit will actually do that. Did you know that if you sit quietly in the morning and you ask the Spirit of God to give you a word, he actually does that? If you actually just, just be quiet, okay? Don't, I just, if, if I say, are you, are you having quiet time? Everybody having quiet time in the morning before you start the day? And, and most of you probably are because you understand the value of that. How much talking does he get to do? If it's typical in my world, I got my list. I got my bro list. There's like 30 dudes on there that I'm praying for all those guys. I got all my church things going on. I got my family things going on. Always lots of family things going on. Amen. So I got all these things and I get done and I read my little devotional book and I circle that. I put one check, two checks, three checks, depending on how good the devotional was. And I get done with all that and I close my book and Deb says, are you done? She kind of sits quiet like a little angel, you know, <laughs> fellowshipping with Jesus. And I'm just doing. <laughs> I'm just saying, Lord, help me with my to-do list. And he's, and I'm, I'm like, I take the trash, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, that's part of my devotion, writing out my to-do list and stuff like that. But I'm learning that it really is good sometimes just to be quiet and ask the question, God, do you have a word for me today? Any of my family here been to Guatemala with Luis? Luis, yes. I see some of the saying, some of you have been with me down there. I love Luis because every single day of his life, he says, Lord, do you have a word for me? He got that from Pappy. 104 years old, his dad, still alive, still hangs out with his dad every day. And Pappy would always say, Luis, what's the word for today? And he would be very disappointed in his son if his son didn't have a word that God gave him that day. Don't give me an old word. Don't give me some stale bread. Give me something new, okay? Something that you learned and discovered today. Greater is he that is in me. Felicia, would you come and, and prepare uh, to lead us back in to worship this morning with your team? Hey, I want to share kind of a story with you um, that you guys, I think you'll, you're, you're probably familiar with the show, The Voice. Anybody watch The Voice? Is it, you like it? Okay, some of you do. Some of you could care less. That's okay. I'm not a big uh, talent show, evening talent show, TV thing. I'm not a big uh, America's Got Talent. I'm, I'm, I got burned out on American Idol a long, long time ago. But we did watch some episodes. The only ones I watch of The Voice are the ones early on when they have the, the blind audition. You with me? Okay. So the blind auditions, if you've never watched the TV show The Voice, the blind auditions, they got these four judges. They're all very well-known, uh, famous singers, and they are the judges. And in the blind auditions, the judges have to turn their chairs away from the stage. They spin the chairs around their face in the back of the room. The person auditioning comes out on the stage. 
and they sing a song and they've got the music and all stuff. And if a judge thinks that's somebody I'd like to have on my team, they hit their button and their chair spins around. Every now and then, a really good singer performs and just knocks out of the park. And like two of the judges hit their button at the same time, two chairs spin around, or maybe three chairs. And every now and then, all four judges go crazy and hit their button in all four chairs. That's a four chair turn. So all four judges are staring at the contestant and they're going, wow, that was amazing. And so they start asking questions. And then the four judges kind of do this thing where they compete, right? Because they want that fantastic singer on their team. So they're basically trying to pull that singer in on their team. They're saying, if I were your judge, man, I could take that talent. I could do something really cool with it. I could, you'd be a superstar if you come on my team. And then the next person would say something. Uh, Blake Shelton would be going, you know, pointing his finger. You know I've won more of these contests. So anyway, you got this thing. All four are just begging, please come. And they have gifts. If you join my team, I'll give you this jacket or sweatshirt. or it. So they're, they do this thing. And finally, the host of the show, he comes out. And he asks a question. I think you know what it is. He said, it's time for you to make a choice. Who will you choose as your coach? Right? You have to make a choice. It's go time. Who will you choose as your coach? One church, I'm going to give you this question today as your host, preacher host. It's time for you to make a choice. Who will you serve as your master? The world or Jesus? You can't have both. You can continue to stick to the wall and get pulled further and further away. I've noticed so many things as I thought about that over the last couple of days. I thought it's interesting, the further away you get from the center, the further away you get from each other. Just look at the spokes on a wheel. How close are the spokes right at the very center? Pretty close together? How far are they on the outside of the wheel? You can look at anything that's got a hub and look at the distance on the outer perimeter. It's further away, the closer you are. To the center, the closer you are to each other. The closer you are to the center, the more in control you are of your life because he's helping you. It's very unstable out on the edge, but if you move everything to the center, it becomes very stable. So I will ask the question this morning, then I'm just going to leave it in your hands. Who will you choose as your Lord? Your problem? Your to do list? The world, man, I got a buddy. He's a close friend of mine, and I love him like a true brother. But I don't really like spending a lot of time with him anymore. And the reason is is he's so negative. You know what's made him negative? He focuses each day on things that are going on in the world around us. He focuses a lot on the political situation in our country. He wants to tell me what's really happening in Israel. He wants to tell me what's going on in in the Ukraine, and he wants to focus on all those things. And that's okay that we're aware, and we have an awareness of those things, but you can't focus on all that stuff. And every day he's focusing on stuff. He said, do you know what the odds are that one of our grandchildren is going to become a transvestite? He he came to me, and I I said, no, I, I I really don't know what the odds are. He said, well, I'll tell you what the odds are. And he just went into this whole big tangent with me. And, and I, I started wondering why. Good point. Yeah. And it's because the focus, the mind, Light is set on all the things of the world. And it's pulling him further and further away. Even though he knows the Lord and he loves the Lord and he has served the Lord for a long, long time. He's getting pulled away. And I just want to say, dude, you've got to get your mind back on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, 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 get, and get back into that embrace and that love relationship. He is in you. You are in him. So I'll ask you one more time. Who will you choose yeah, we need today to that, man. Good is your Lord, your problem, your list, the things of earth, the great hurt that you went through at one point in time? You got to let that go because it's pulling you down. Maybe it's this sin. I, I, I said to the church last week, I said, a man of God today should have a bolt cutters in one hand and a welding torch in the other hand. And I mean that. Bolt cutters to break the chains that are holding you back and a welding torch to strengthen the chains that are pulling you forward. 
We all need that. So today, if you need to be free, right, then just come up. Just kneel down and just ask God. If you choose him to be your coach today, if you want to get your mind redirected on him today, this is a great starting point right here, right now. But you have to make the choice right now. That's the cool thing about that show is you can't go put a committee together. You can't go pray or fast for the next 40 days. Uh, you have to choose right now. Hey, if there's anybody in the room, you don't know me very well, a lot of you, and I don't know you. It would be easy for me to assume because you look like a really cool group. You look like a Christian group. You're a beautiful church. That I'd say, well, basically I'm looking things over and, and, and I see everybody is in a really good relationship with Jesus Christ. But I don't know that. Luis, down in Impacto, one time said to me, uh, Pastor, I will lead the devotions tonight. I said, okay, that's fine. And it was when we were on a mission, had my missions team down there. It was a building team. It was all men. We had 12 men. And there was another church that was with us. And Luis did the message that night, and he started preaching the plan of salvation. And, and I'm sitting there kind of thinking, Luis, we're missionaries. Obviously, we know the Lord, and we're, and we're a saved group of people. You don't have to preach. He basically was preaching, you know, the Romans road. Salvation 101, if you want to know Jesus, you can make him as your Lord and Savior tonight. And I was sitting there kind of dismayed a little bit because I thought, wow, we're, we're kind of past that. And that night he prayed, and the men from both groups, my church and the other, they, their heads were down and they were praying. And he said, if anyone needs Jesus to be their Lord and Savior tonight, would you let me know so I can pray? And two men from my missions team raised their hand to receive Jesus. And I said to myself that night, I'm not called to assume people are with Jesus. I'm called to invite people to Jesus. Amen. So I will invite you this morning if you would like to have Jesus as your Savior. And I feel like I'm led to do it the way that Luis does it down in Impacto. Can we do that? Could you just bow your heads for a moment, please? Please, everybody. All eyes closed. I don't want people thinking about other people in the room. This is just between you and Jesus right now. But if you need to be freed from the gravitational pull of the world, and you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to be in that relationship that I've preached on and talked about this morning, would you just do something really simple this morning and, and just point a finger up towards heaven as high as you can and say, I want Jesus as high as you can, reach that arm up, be bold, be bold, be bold. I need Jesus. I want Jesus. I want centripetal force, Lord. Keep pointing, keep pointing, keep pointing. Let them know. I need your help. I need your rescue. Praise Jesus. Praise God. Let me pray right now for you folks that are saying, I desperately want Jesus right now. Father God, I pray in the name of my Lord, my Savior, my all, Jesus Christ. You, Lord, who rescued me from the miry clay. You who have rescued me from myself 10,000 times. Lord, I pray in your name. And I pray in the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within me. I pray for those that are reaching to heaven this morning and saying, I need Jesus. I want to be pulled back to the center of it all. I want to be controlled by you, not by the world, God. I need your rescue and I need your help right now this morning. Father, would you bless those that have their hands up this morning? Would you even prompt them maybe to come forward this morning, just to stand in the presence near the front so we can celebrate that and help them and pray over them? We love you. We trust you. We need you, Lord. You are the greater pull. You are the greater one. You are the centripetal force that we so badly need in these days to get us through. We love you, Lord. We give you the morning. And I give you this time in this sacred altar right now that if anyone would like to just come and be prayed over, would they find the courage to step up, step out, and come to the front and let us love on them with the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching today's video. If you made a commitment of any kind or you made a first time decision to accept Christ, we want to hear from you. Email us at info at onechurchnc.net.
If today's message encouraged you, we want to encourage you to give so that we can continue to share the hope of Jesus. You can do that by visiting onechurchnc.net slash give.